Welcome to the Fabulous 413. And so, later on in the show, we're going to bring Jess Colson and Nikai Fonden to the studio to talk about Girls Inc. of the Valley, an organization that spent over 40 years uplifting and supporting young women in the area and who just opened a new facility in Holyoke. And we'll sit down with one of our favorite food justice figures in Western Mass, Liz O'Gilvy. She's part of Gardening the Community and Springfield Food Policy Council. She worked on the Farm Bill, and this Sunday you'll have a chance to hear one of her many stories at CISA's Field Notes Storytelling Event at the Academy of Music. But first, we tread softly into a pronunciation point of contention. Remember that time you gave out the phone number last time, Emily Brewster? Please call 800-639-8850. That was nice. Yay. You do that so well, Emily Brewster. (laughs) Oh, thank you. Time for another Fund Drive edition of our Word Nerd segment with Emily Brewster, resident wordster from Merriam-Webster, our dictionary in Springfield. While you're busy writing your emails of query about dictionary-related things to the Word Nerd, you might as well go online to nepm.org and make a contribution because we're trying to get 225 contributions today. And you know what? Like, you can even get our brand spanking new t-shirt if you do that. We should get you a t-shirt, Emily Brewster. Yes. Yeah. But only if you would wear it for things other than painting the house. That's what I'm always like. I'll take <laughs> actually, that T-shirt, actually, but to paint the house. Honestly, like if there were color splatter, it wouldn't necessarily detract. Yeah. It's like an emo- I'm intrigued. It's like an emoji rundown of all things Western math with one particular weird emoji that I can't figure out. Yeah, I don't know what it is. It looks it, like a minion, yeah. sort of. Ba, 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 na, na. Yeah, or a, a bandit who's also an egg. It's yeah. like Humpty Dumpty the, <laughs> the burglar. Yeah. Like, is it supposed to be like Dr. Seuss or like... Calvin Coolidge or like some other figure from here? I think listeners need to decide. I think they should decide. Anyway, we we did get an email from a listener, uh, Mike, whose handle is Papa Mike. He writes, assumedly he, Dear Khalees and Monty, two of my favorite radio personalities. Aww. If possible, I would like our valued wordsmith to address two of my hated word pronunciations. Often pronouncing T instead of silent T. I cringe every time I hear it. My 73-year-old sibling never pronounced the T before. Now she does it without knowing it. It's the little things when you've been together with somebody that long or you've had a relationship (laughs) with somebody for that amount of time. My parents didn't raise her that way. The other is verses pronounced verse. Regards, Mike. I've never heard the second one. I have. Wouldn't you be like, it was Rocky versus Apollo. Hang on, be no rematch. The wrong one. No, I say versus. Yeah, I mean, I do too, but I definitely heard it. Yeah, no, I don't think I've ever heard that one. That's that's interesting. Yeah. What's your take well, on I, Mike's I questions? have a little bit of bad news. Uh-oh. I mean, well, no, I mean, it's not really bad news. <laughs> it's... <sighs> is it the same news we hear every time, which is like, guess what, everybody? Stop being judgmental because they were right too. Well, in this case, it is that the oldest pronunciation of this word, O-F-T-E-N, did have the T pronounced. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. In the early 1500s, the word began as a variant of what was the more common form, oft. Right. Right. Like, is, which yes. we now know mostly in compounds, like oft repeated. Mm-hmm. Right? right. But yeah, the T eventually got dropped, even though it was first pronounced. And apparently, according to the lore, and this is, this is documented lore, uh, Queen Elizabeth, she did not use the pronunciation with the T. And that likely contributed to the often pronunciation being the prestige pronunciation. She tried to soften the often? <laughs> well, I, I don't know if she really tried so much as she just accomplished it, Monty. She was Queen Elizabeth. Right? Which, like, which Queen Elizabeth like, are we talking about? The one that just the died? First, the first okay. one. The yeah. first one back back in the 1500s. Yep. Uh-huh. She died in, I think, 1603. Yep. But during the same time period, this is an unusual thing, actually, there was someone documenting pronunciation of the English language of the time, contemporaneous with her. And according to this guy's book, people were still saying the T pronunciation, but that was being regarded as, you know, no good, thumbs down. So it's interesting that they're having these conversations, writing them down at at this time. I think so, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. People cared about this. I mean, you think about what was happening at this period of time. Um, <laughs> print was kind of uh, it was it was becoming more available. Right. So before this period of time, most people would maybe see one book in their whole lives, right? And it was a Bible, and they would learn their pronunciation solely through auditory information. They wouldn't learn words by reading them. 
learning words by reading them often contributes to. Do you mean often? Uh, <laughs> yeah, did I? Yeah, I don't even know. I guess I say. You I, say I often. Think I, you say often. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, yeah. sorry, but reading books often contributes to. It contributes to kind of non-standard pronunciations because people learn a word by what it looks like. And then they come to find out later that the word they're saying as outlier, O-U-T-L-I-E-R, is really pronounced outlier. Right. Man's laughter. I love that one. <laughs> or, or like... Wow, I hadn't heard that one before. <laughs> wow. Man's laughter for manslaughter. Everybody wow. gets really upset about this man's laughter. I don't understand <laughs> why. <laughs> or, you know, when you finally dis- figure out how to say unctuous. Is that how you say it? Unctuous. Um, or rendezvous, where Emily Brewster is one of the owners, Rendezvous. Uh, I mean, how on earth would you know any of this? I, also, given Dune, I listen to the audiobook versions of Dune, and mm-hmm. the audiobook reader calls the Zendaya character Chaney the whole oh, time. No. And then no, it's Chani not, in the movie. Chani. Yeah, so. But if you're not reading it, you, you're just going by auditory. You're just like, oh, wow, the, you know, Paul Atreides is attracted to Dick Chaney. Trying to think how to... Uh respond carefully and cautiously here. There were editors involved. Like, no one fixed that? I don't know. Maybe that's how Frank Herbert wanted to do it. They, that audiobook's been around for a long time. Uh, I mean, given how closely, like, Herbert wanted to use Arabic, it definitely makes more sense as Chani than Chaney. Yeah. Anyway. Neither here nor there. He went here. down another dune wormhole. I must conquer the worm. Conquer Shai Halud. We're talking about Mike and his question about often versus often. More- I think I only put the T in when I'm using it for emphasis. I say oft. I say oft a lot. Often. But I I think in regular casual conversation, I'm going to say often. I remember the time when I switched to saying often because I was criticized by somebody in high school because I said often. And he pointed out to me that the word soften does not have the T pronounced. And I right there and then decided, oh, okay, now I say often. Oh, well, well. Mike's 73 year old sibling needs to hear that example, I guess, <laughs> to get back in <laughs> or line not. with the or way not. they were raised. Now, when I started working at Merriam-Webster, which is a long time ago now, both pronunciations were, were at the entry for this word, but there was a little division symbol, like the, you know, the line with the dot, it's like a, it's mm-hmm. like a colon with a line through the middle. And um, we call it an obelisk. And the obelisk is a signal in pronunciation guides that tells you that this is a disfavored pronunciation. Ah. And until 2019, which is not that long ago, there was an obelisk symbol next to the often pronunciation. But... But after then 2019, it was removed. When the pandemic hit, everybody was like, you know what? Maybe these aren't the things that we need to worry about anymore. Like, Maybe I need more teas in my life. I'll just bring that right back. <laughs> well, I, right. Actually, it, the change happened in 2019 before the before, before oh, we all right. before we all knew about that. Gotcha. Um, but it's right. So maybe it contributed to the to the horror that followed. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> no. But there was a shift, right? And this shift, this pron- these pronunciation guide changes, these pronunciation um, changes in the dictionary are made because of evidence. So. The fact is that the often pronunciation has become more and more common and is now heard in the speech that is least likely to be stigmatized, is heard in the speech of what can be described as careful speakers Mm. um, that has the T when when that used to not be the case. I mean, in one of our dictionaries, I think it was the one published in 1934, Webster's Second, there's a note written by an editor who... I'm sure is now long gone, <laughs> calling this pronunciation illiterate. Oh. Mm. Yeah. That's which is not the kind of than Mike's words that... for his sister. I mean, yeah. I guess that's true because if you're if you hear the word often and people are saying it as often and you haven't seen it and don't know that there's a T in it, you wouldn't bother. But if you are saying often, there's a good chance that you're saying often because you are familiar with the spelling of the word. Yeah. To call it an illiterate pronunciation is very questionable. <laughs> if it were up to me, I would not have let that note stand. That's, that's fair. <laughs> yeah. If soften is soften and often is often, does it have to do with the E-N coming after the F-T? Are there other cases where that's true? It does have to do with the structure of the word, for sure. The E-N added to the end of the word oft. We have words like soften and hasten and fasten. And in all of those, you have a root word, soft, haste, fast, where the T has fallen away, the audible T. And that's what happened in often also. Then we also have the word listen. And though there is a word list as a verb, that's not the origin of the word listen. So listen never had its T pronounced. Listen. 
No. <laughs> Nobody says that. No, you no, just list no. less. Listerine. Yeah. That's different. Why would there be a reason to issue one particular pronunciation over another? Why? What would be wrong with often? Because of these often petty 73-year-long is... <laughs> disputes you have with your sister. I can't wait to have these uh, kind of complaints against my sister. I mean, I already have them against some of my siblings. We just get into it at family <laughs> gatherings. It's all done with love <sighs> and pointed all right. sticks. Yeah, I think, I mean, that's probably the best reason to hold on to these sorts of things. What about Mike's other question? He has not cast aspersions on his sister about this particular one. He just says that this bothers him, the verse's pronunciation of verse. Yeah. What's um, the dictionary say about that, Emily Brewster from Merriam-Webster? Also, why is it not this when you see it? Because when you shorten versus, it's VS, right? Yeah. So why would it not be this instead of verse? Right. And we don't say this. We give two pronunciations for V-E-R-S-U-S, the preposition versus and verses. So one has the, the voice. Versus. The voiced sibilant at the end, the s, z, and the other one has the unvoiced sibilant. Sibilant. Check. 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 Two. Sibilant. Um, but we do not give verse as a pronunciation. This makes me think about a word that I was looking into a bunch of years ago, and we still do not define it. It is not used much in print still. That is the verb verse to mean playing against. So like, oh, our team is versing this other team. But see, this comes from this pronunciation. It means the same thing. Don't you think that this, they yeah. verbed this word because pe enough people say verses as verse? Yeah, yeah. No, it makes good sense. I mean, like, I'm not sure which one came first. It's got to be just the mispronunciation of verses. I mean, when you're talking quickly, like if you're saying, like, oh, did you read Spy vs. Spy? Like you don't want to wrap your mouth around the whole versus spy thing. But I Maybe, will. you know. Yeah. <laughs> Careful pronunciators will. But other people probably yeah. skip right over that. And that's probably why that has come about. Mm. Right. And you two are particularly careful speakers because of your jobs. You Often I am. <laughs> <laughs> it's a constant battle against my occasional Boston accent, which likes to rear its ugly head at very inopportune moments. Same. But it's very natural for a language to drop sounds for the sake of efficiency. Mm -hmm. We've talked about We once again refer a, to my Boston accent. And, <laughs> mm, yeah, all the R's. Yeah. Goodbye R's. Who needs those? Well, and this makes me, th I think we've talked about ice coffee, right? And about how it used to be iced cream. Right. It was never, it, and then it became ice cream. It's the same sort of thing. These sounds get dropped because they're not required for there to be comprehension. You don't actually need the second syllable of versus to communicate what you're trying to communicate. And the person will probably understand what you mean anyway. Do you think that there is any movement towards this pronunciation verse that is raising the ire of listener Mike, who's sent this email about? I think it's a long way, or still a pretty long way anyway, from dictionary inclusion, because it is not common in published edited text. But how would it be I if it's a pronunciation? But I mean, are, are you hearing this? There's an example on our dictionary page, free trade versus protection. Are we hearing people say on the news, free trade versus protection? I don't think so. I it's feel like I really... grew up hearing that enough that I would say like, oh, at some point that's going to get in there. I probably am guilty of having said it at periods of my life as well. Yeah, I am I'm not on, on that page. Mike is <laughs> right, so well... mad at me right now. <laughs> Well, what I haven't done yet is queried our pronunciation editor about this, and I will do that and follow up with you next time. Oh, okay. well, thank you. And I'm sure Mike, our listener, will be appreciative of that as well. I hope you continue to get along with your 73-year-old uh, sibling, Mike. Send us emails often. Yes. Sorry. Oh, whoops. There's nothing wrong with it, Khalees. It's okay. Embrace, <laughs> embrace the often. Can't stop, won't stop. <laughs> <laughs> and if you have a question for our dictionary in Springfield, Massachusetts, from our resident word nerd, Green Fields. Emily Brewster, you can send it our way, thefab413 at nepm.org, and uh, we'll try to answer it on this show. And uh, while you're there, you know, make a contribution at nepm.org because we're in the middle of the fun drive. Please call 800 69 8850. Aw, thanks, Emily Brewster. Soon we'll hear from Jess Colson and Nikai Fonden of Girls Inc. of the Valley to talk about their incredible programming for young women in Western Mass and their brand new Holyoke facility. And next, the amazing mission of Liz Ogilvie as she readies for CISA's Field Note Storytelling event in Northampton this Sunday. You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on 885 NEPM. 
we can hint about what story you're going to tell on Sunday, but we can tell a different story now. Yeah. You want a happy story or a sad story? <laughs> Black people story. <laughs> You get to choose. Which sometimes are all of the above. Is that yeah. right? <laughs> Time for Local Hero Spotlight with Jacob Nelson from CISA, the local hero folks who are hosting Field Notes this Sunday at the Academy of Music in Northampton. It's a storytelling event. Jacob, before we introduce one of our storytellers and guests and people that I totally idolize, tell us what Field Notes is all about. So Field Notes is a live storytelling show. It's a similar format if you've listened to like The Moth on public radio app of your choosing. Um, <laughs> or the radio or itself, the radio. Itself. Five on the weekends. People do that. Um, or if you have... <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! I didn't realize that we were going to get shade thrown at us this early in, in our talk. <laughs> I didn't even mean to throw shade either, so apologies there. <laughs> um, or if you've, if you've um, if you're a follower of NEPM's Valley Voices, which is another um, amazing storytelling series around the valley throughout the year. Field Notes is a similar format of storytelling to both of those, but it's not competitive like either one of those is sometimes. So yeah, it'll be at the Academy of Music in Northampton uh, this Sunday, 2 to 4, We'll have 10 wonderful storytellers who will be just giving snapshots of their lives, moments where local food or farming really made an impact on them. Uh, And the purpose of this show is, first and foremost, just to celebrate all of the diversity and the wonderful people and the creativity and the hard work and the love that goes into building a local food system. And in many cases, swimming against the stream or going against the grain, that is something that we want to lift up. Working so close to a lot of these people for CISA, we get to see many of these stories and peek behind the scenes a lot of the time. And it's really cool what we get to experience. And they're just amazing stories that come up. And so this is a chance for us to share them with all of you. And the second thing that I really love about Field Notes is it expands the broader narrative, the big story we all tell ourselves about what local food is and who builds the local food system and who is it for and who really should be welcome there. I think that is a lot of what the story of the person who we have the privilege of being in the studio with today is going to talk about. I don't know if I can introduce. Yes, or please if you want do. To, we'll, K- Kalise and I will both glow too much if yes. we introduce her. Oh, good yes. grief! Well, we've been asking Liz if she wanted to tell a story at Field Notes for a couple of years, and she. I'm so excited she finally said yes this year. Um, but yeah, we're here with Liz Ogilvy, who I don't even know how to like. How do you introduce yourself these days, Liz? We call her so a superhero. Superhero. That you have your hands involved in. <laughs> Springfield Food Policy Council, gardening the community, food justice advocate in Mason Square, Springfield, amongst other places. Total hunger fighting badass, as I called her at the White House conference on hunger, nutrition, and health. He did call me that. I'm, <laughs> I'm excited to be here. You know. First of all, Monty, you've got to get cable or something so you can find somebody else besides me to idolize because that's pretty pretty <laughs> sad. And I'm heartily disappointed to learn that this is not a competitive enterprise. Oh, <laughs> you got to win this thing I on kinda, Sunday? Yes. <laughs> you know, I don't like to be in it unless I'm going to win it. Um, <laughs> but seriously, CISA has been chasing me for years. And part of the challenge is because I am working in so many different spaces, it's like, what is my story? In addition to the local food system work, I'm trying to keep chairs warm for other brown people by sitting at the Massachusetts Food System Collaborative as a steering committee member. And the same is true for Mass Farm to School. And last year, I started working on what was supposed to be the 2023 Farm Bill. And it's looking like it's going to be the 2024 or the 2025 farm bill. Mm -hmm. You know, for folks who don't know, it is the largest piece of federal legislation, and it controls everything that has to do with everything about food. And it's a hot mess. Oh, yeah. Like many other things at the federal level. (laughs) So now I'm happy to just be in Springfield and not in D.C. as much as I have been. Yeah, and I'm excited about Field Notes. I was joking about it being a competitive (laughs) enterprise, although I do want to find out more about these other competitions. (laughs) We can welcome you to Valley Voices, too. You can submit your stories. I'm sure they'd love to have you. They would. We're speaking with Liz Ogilvy, who will be telling a story at Field Notes amongst how many other people on Sunday, Jacob? There will be 10 people getting up on stage to tell a story. We don't want you to divulge what story you're going to tell on Sunday, but you want to give us a little hint about what it'll be about? Well, I'll tell you, CISA comes up with these catchy titles for Field Notes, and this year it's In the Weeds. And just as a black person living on this land, I'm in the weeds all the time. (laughs) And as a farmer, you know, In the Weeds is just where we live. And then there's COVID, which 
were weeds that were like seaweed and a sand pit and just horror altogether. But out of that, some pretty cool stuff happened. And so so that's my tease. Nice. Cool. You have a million other stories, and I'm sure it was hard to pick what one story to tell for one storytelling event. But tell us a story today, Lizzo Gilby. Yeah, well, you know, when I first started thinking about this, I was thinking about, well, how did I get to be where I am in this space in the food system? And obviously, gardening the community was a big doorway in for me. I had worked on change stuff, had just moved back to Springfield after living in places like Chicago and on the West Coast, and trying to figure out what's my lane. I didn't know it was going to be what's my row. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but because of meeting these young kids at Gardening the Community, they were teenagers, and they were working on letting neighbors know that you could buy food in your neighborhood that was grown in beautiful soil without pesticides, and they just set me on fire. And so I then decided, well, we need a recruiting system for gardening the community, so I better start working at elementary schools and get some school gardens in. That was really where my world broke wide open, because you teach little kids how to grow a cherry tomato and everything changes. And it was not easy. I was thinking about a time when We opened up a garden at Rebecca Johnson Elementary School, and, you know, I'm an odd duck in my neighborhood. I live in McKnight. It's mostly black and brown people and diehard white liberals who have been there for 30 or 40 years and just (laughs) aren't leaving. That's my street. Do we live in the same neighborhood? (laughs) Yeah, we live in the same neighborhood. Anyhow, we opened up this garden, and some of the neighbors, I use that term loosely, decided they were going to test me. And I would come into the garden to get it ready for a lesson and find all sorts of unmentionables in the garden beds. And a couple of times we had to take all the soil out and start all over. And I did it between weeping and running noses, but determined because, yeah, I am a badass a little bit. (laughs) I hate to be proven wrong. And, And, you know, when I started that work, we had, I think, five school gardens and maybe only three of them active. And now I'm really proud to say about Springfield Public Schools and their food service partner, Sodexo, that we have 32 school gardens. That's amazing. That's awesome. Yeah. Did anybody ever come up to you and just explain why there was so much pushback for having a garden at the school? Nobody had to explain. You know, I've been black a long time. And when people come in and do things and then leave, it leaves a lot of people disappointed. And there's a lot of do-gooders, and they come in every color. I am not that. I'm just a black person trying to figure out how to survive this experience of being human. And I think people weren't sure I was for real. But then they figured out that I lived literally down the street and that these children, although not of my body, were mine. It shifted. And then I started giving them the stuff we were growing and stuff I was growing from my own lot. And... They did become my neighbors. We'll have more with All Around Food Justice champion Springfield's Liz Ogilvie shortly, as well as a talk with Jess Coulson and Nikai Fonden of Girls Inc. of the Valley. You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on 88.5 NEPM. We're speaking with Liz Ogilvie, who's one of the storytellers at CISA's Field Notes, which will happen this Sunday at the Academy of Music. She works with the Springfield Food Policy Council, gardening the community, and more. We're also with Jacob Nelson of CISA. Liz, I'm wondering why this is the year that you've decided to tell a story at Field Notes, and what like what makes you want to get up on that stage if it's not a competition? If Since it's not it's to not win. A competition. Well, I mean, you're so darn cute, Jacob, that <laughs> it was really hard to say no. Yeah, he is cute. I don't know. I just... <laughs> There were these moments throughout the work. Like when I first got into food system work, I would was working with amazing people, some from CESA, some from other places, and they would say, we've got to tear down the tofu curtain. And I had no idea what they were talking about. Um, and then finally at a meeting, I lost it, and I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? I don't want any tofu. I'm trying to get some corn. Um, and some green beans for the people in my neighborhood. And I always knew it was a metaphor, but I wanted them to understand that if they want to engage everybody, then talk to everybody. COVID really illuminated the inequities for me, particularly because a lot of my work is really public health driven. It's really not just driven by hunger. It's driven by what, forgive my vernacular, 
fast food, going back to the days of commodities, has done for our communities. And I thought, I want people to ask more questions. And so to do that, I need to get them interested. And there's a sense of desperation that I feel right now. One of the ways that I have seen directly that you are trying to change people's notions about foodways is with some of the greenery that's being brought into Springfield specifically, making it more food plants like fruit shrubs, like oh. fruit shrubs, fruit pl- fruit trees. Why is a shift like that important, and how is it going? <laughs> Well, where I plant and where Gardening the Community plants and where the people that I have some influence over plant, it's going very well. (laughs) Um, From a systemic perspective, it's just not. We are Springfield, well, Hamden County. Mm -hmm. Springfield, if you're from the south like I sort of am, you think of Springfield as the county seat. And every public health agency, including the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, ranks Hamden County as being 14th for public health. We have the worst cases of diabetes in adults and child children. And I mean type 2 in kids, not type 1 that you get as an autoimmune disorder. And cardiac disease. And Hamden County lost 2,800 people during COVID that we know of. And the majority of them had food-related preventable diseases. So if we're going to plant a tree, can we plant an apple tree or a peach tree or a pear tree? I hear responses like, oh, it'll be a mess because of all the fallen fruit despite the fact that homelessness is on the rise and hunger is on the rise, food insecurity, I don't say because it's too kind and not really indicative of what people are experiencing. I think folks will pick the fruit, and I think they will because they pick from our lots. I actually pointed out to folks here, we have service berry trees out in front of the station here in Springfield, and when we would walk to lunch, I'd just, like, reach up and grab some. That's great. And they're like, what is this? I'm like, you can eat these. These are delicious. (laughs) I planted blackberry bushes. I bought a lot that's next to my house. It was actually the homestead of Primus Mason. Didn't know that till I started trying to buy it from the city, but was able to buy it through an abutting lot program because by then people were starting to think of me as the healthy food lady. They didn't know that I was volunteering at GTC and helping on the board, and but I hadn't grown a thing in my life. Um, but that lot forced me to and started out with three little rows of kale, which I despise. Um, <laughs> But kale, it never kale, fails it you. It never fails. It, it's, so, always, it's super forgiving. So it just Sometimes it goes through the whole like, winter somehow. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, which is why I'm scared of it. <laughs> like, I don't want to see something covered in five feet of snow and pop up and say, I'm still here. I mean, <laughs> don't you, though? Like, take that strength and bring it into your own yes, body. Yes, I do. And I tear it up and put it in soup. But I planted blackberry bushes all around the perimeter of this lot to some degree as a barrier. But the kids walking towards the bus stop or from the bus stop. Their faces were purple. They were just stained with blackberries. So I'm on a mission, and I am tenacious, and I believe that Mayor Sarno wants to take good care of his people here in Springfield, Um, and I believe Parks and Rec does, and I'm going to help them understand that planting fruit trees amidst all the wonderful oak trees would be a fine thing to do. And maybe your listeners will help me. <laughs> We're speaking with Liz O'Gilvy, who's a storyteller this Sunday at Field Notes, hosted by CISA at the Academy of Music in Northampton. And Jacob Nelson from CISA joins us as well. Liz, this conversation is, is reminding me that I think every time I talk to you, I learn something different about your past and who you are and how it brought you here today that I didn't know before, which is true whenever you talk to someone interesting who's done a lot of things. Jacob, when we all met the first time, yeah. and I can make everything a reason to back out of something. <laughs> so that day, oh, tell the story it of was, this. Yeah. Um, like I was, I was committed to doing this in very large part because Jacob is just has just grabbed me, just grabbed a piece of my heart. I don't know why exactly, but... I woke up that morning and it was snowing. And I was like, oh, it's snowing. (laughs) And kind of disappointed, but also kind of like, well, now I don't really have to drive up the hill because if I'm getting snow, they must be getting a ton. So I reach out to Jacob and he's like, yeah, we got nothing. It's a little bit wet, but there's nothing really happening here. And I don't like to let people down. And so my conscience started to like work on me and I could hear my grandmother's voice saying, you say white people aren't listening. White people are gonna listen to this. You better go do this thing. (laughs) So I text Jake and I say, I'll get in the car and we'll see what Holyoke looks like. And it is 
hellish between Springfield and Holyoke. We're talking about 15 minutes. And then I get on the other side of Holyoke, and it's like the most beautiful winter day. <laughs> Stupid so... tofu curtain strikes again. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm like, oh, shit. I guess I'm going up this hill. <laughs> so I did. And then I walk in this room, and there is everyone from everywhere. What was that like? Well, you know, my mind always has like 14 conversations happening at one time. So my first thought was, oh, my gosh, I'm not the only brown person. And then, but damn, I'm the only black person. And BIPOC is BIPOC for a reason, because the experiences of black and indigenous people are different than other people of color. Mm -hmm. And so I felt I got to do this. The, I mean, the other thing is I was doing some genealogy research with my great aunt who I adored who died in 2019 not from COVID but just before COVID and it's odd to say you're thankful that someone's gone but I'm glad she didn't live through that but through being with her and wanting to help her have a sense of herself I learned that I descend from someone who was enslaved in this state in this commonwealth and that's a different thing because we like to think of slavery or that period of enslavement as a sin of the South. Oh, yeah, everyone likes to forget. Yeah. Forget that it was the law of the land and that Massachusetts was the first state to make it legal. Mm -hmm. So everything that I do now, including field notes, is through that lens, the, the lens of an opportunity to tell a part of the food system story that doesn't get told. Along those lines, like, have you been able to connect with other black farmers who are doing larger scale work? Like, not just, not that connecting with gardeners, what people do and stuff at home is not its own thing because it is very empowering to grow your own food no matter the scale. But, like, especially in this area, like, connecting with other black farmers, have you been able to do that in this work? I think... In Western Mass, I probably know every non-white farmer, it feels like at times. And in Central Mass, there's this wonderful organization, World Farmers, mm -hmm. where they have 270 immigrant, mostly black, from different countries in the continent, Kenya, Somalia, Ghana, who are farming. And little teas, they're part of the reason that we were able to feed as many people um, as we were during the pandemic. And when I say we, I mean the Springfield Food Policy Council and Gardening the Community. So you'll hear a little bit more about that. Okay, I'll stop asking. I okay. think you're going to win on Sunday, Liz. That's not, I, mean, <laughs> I heard it's not a competition. It's not a competition. Monty. Oh, yeah, I forgot. <laughs> I hope a lot of folks will come. I think that these are stories of joy. Um, there's probably a little bit of sadness in all of them. I haven't heard all the other stories, but I've met the other speakers, and you don't get one without the other. Like, we are able to be joyful because of hardship, I think. But I think it will be a little bit of truth-telling about the food system. You know, as a black person, I understand we built the agricultural system here. Folks who I descend from, and directly and not, are the reason that the United States is the United States, has the economic base that it has. And it's time for us to think about that. And we're strong enough. Like, build some core muscles. <laughs> My friend B. Dewberry talks about we have to build our civic muscle. We have to strengthen our backbone. We can hold that we enslaved people and built big universities with that money and big insurance companies and big banks. And now emerging people are going to own land, if I have anything to do with it. People of all shades, but in particular, people with more melanin. Liz O'Gilvy will be telling a story at Field Notes this Sunday at the Academy of Music in Northampton. It's presented by CISA, the local hero folks. You can find out more by going to buylocalfood.org. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you, Monty and Khalees. Sure. As, <laughs> as if Liz O'Gilvy wasn't inspiring enough, coming up more inspiring women and girls will talk with Jess Colson from and Nikai Fonden of Girls Inc. of the Valley. You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on 885 NEPM. The Fabulous 413 podcast is funded by Northeast Solar, homegrown in Hatfield, Massachusetts, and providing energy savings for their customers for over 10 years. Learn more at northeast-solar.com.
Welcome back to the Fabulous 413. I'm Monty Belmonte. And I'm Khalees Smith. Girls Inc. of the Valley is based in Holyoke. Their mission is to inspire all youth to be strong, smart, and bold by providing them the opportunity to develop and achieve their full potential. Their vision is of an equitable society in which gender equality is a reality. And here to tell us more about their mission and their new location is Jess Colson, Director of Development and Communications for Girls Inc. of the Valley and board member Nikai Fonden. Thank you both for joining us. Thanks for having us. (laughs) Tell us about what the programs you are, uh, that you all offer are. Yeah, so we offer programs for ages 8 to 18. Uh, We host after school programs at our new center, which you just highlighted on 480 Street and Hamden, 480 Hamden Street in Holyoke, excuse me. We also have a bunch of in-school partnerships in Chickabee, Springfield, and Holyoke Public Schools, uh, where students get Girls Inc. programming as part of their school day. Um, We offer really robust summer programs as well. Um, Our Eureka program is a highlight focusing on STEM and college and career readiness for 7th through 12th graders. And you can go from elementary to middle and high and then get into the, it takes you the whole way through your education, right? That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah we, we've we seen that growth from kids in the program who started as, you know, little third graders, maybe a little bit more timid, and they really get that mentorship from other students at Girls Inc., but also trusted mentors like board members like Nakai. Oh, cool. So it encourages co-mentoring too, like girls are already in, girls and women already in the program that are like hooked up with, uh, that sounds, that's a terrible verb to use, but, <laughs> but, uh, but with younger students too to help them along as well. Yeah, that's exactly right. And our new home allows for the teens and the elementary school youth to be together in a space. And we've seen such great bonding with kids in very different age groups, whereas previous spaces were separate. They didn't have that uh, cohesive time together. Did it used to be a smaller age group and expanded recently? Or was it has it always been the full stretch of your like public school years? Yeah, that's a great question. So it's always been that full stretch. We've recently added in programming for young professionals as well. So kids, kids, I should say, young professionals who are in their college years still needing that support, like writing their resume, trying to find that first job out of college. We know our impact doesn't stop at 18. So we're really trying to look at that impact into the 20s, you know, mid 20s. Nakai Fondin, you're a board member of Girls Inc. Tell us what made you want to get involved as a board member. I loved the fact that, one, the impact I saw as a volunteer. So I decided, like, you know, I was graduating from college and I was like, I want to get back into the community. And I really wanted to see who were the players who were directly helping young women and girls um, in our area, specifically ones who, like, you know, look like me. And I came across Girls Inc. and I wanted to get involved anyway, anyway, they would accept me. (laughs) And I decided, you know what, we're going to sit down and like, you know, do some volunteering. And then um, as I like, you know, grew with the organization and I, my love for the organization started to grow. So um, when the opportunity for the board came across, I said, absolutely. um, Because I see the impact that it has had on young women and girls in the community. And just even, um, young women and girls like me coming out of college who have like you know been in their cycle and have been able to grow through experiences like this. So sitting on a diverse board um, with diverse staff and diverse um, membership has just been absolutely amazing to watch. Were you involved in a program like this in your school years? But did that encourage you to to be a part of this one? Actually, so no, not necessarily. Like, you would have, like, little things like Girl Scouts and things like that here and there. Um, But when I was in middle school and high school, no, that wasn't anything that I had. But one of the things that I do know is that I did participate in a lot of different extracurriculars that made me into, like, you know, the leader that I am today. But I swear I would have probably ran so much faster if I had a Girls Inc. in my back corner. (laughs) Nevertheless, Girls Inc. honored you as a dream maker at their Spirit of Girls uh, Gala in 2022. Uh, Tell us, maybe you don't want to glow about yourself, but Jess, (laughs) tell us why Nakai was honored in that way. I'd be very happy to rant and rave about (laughs) Nakai anytime, my friend here. You know, Nakai steps up continuously for her community, and I just felt myself get a little emotional by that. But we really recognize the work that she does in the greater Springfield, Holyoke, Chicopee communities, and the way she shows up for youth is so powerful. So when we're thinking of people to nominate for somebody who's making other people's dreams come true, it's a no-brainer. She shows up for youth. She runs 
runs public speaking workshops for them. She helps them get the confidence they need to kind of go forth and live their life. So no brainer. Anytime. Well, well earned, it sounds like, (laughs) Nakai. Thank you. Thank Um, you. Is it just STEM and sports? Are there like other like arts things that get done? Are there humanities things that are done at Girls Inc. of the Valley? So it's we have three pillars, strong, smart and bold. So strong is really focused on um, mental wellness and physical wellness. We do a lot of yoga, a lot of um, healthy sexuality type workshops, strong. I just highlighted SMART. There is all the academic and um, other resources that you need to be successful in school. So we have mentor support. We have homework help, things um, and resources that kids need to kind of continue on with their growth. And we've seen that gap get even wider because of the pandemic. Right. You know, literacy is a big issue facing our communities right now. So we're working to get mentors and volunteers in to help out with literacy. And then BOLD, like Nakai highlighted, is really those leadership programs, opportunities to use your voice and to leverage your own power. You have an event at the end of the month, we but do. in the minute we have left, tell us a little bit about that event. Yeah. Nikai, do you want to take this one? Yeah. Sure. We have a lovely event happening on March 22nd. It is our Spirit of Girls annual event. It is a beautiful event being held at the Basketball Hall of Fame, and we are highlighting the work that has been done over the past year. We are celebrating our 40 plus years of being existing in the Valley, which is really exciting, um, especially during this year, Women's History Month which is great. Um, So we are really just gearing up for a really great night of great networking, um, hearing the young women's stories, being able to um, just enjoy in the work that's being done and be able to raise a good amount so that we can continue doing the work that we would like to continue doing. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that we have some really great things, some great surprises (laughs) that are coming around the corner, um, which will be absolutely amazing as well so um, it's going to be a great time there at the Basketball Hall of Fame for Spirit of Girls March 22nd Nakai Fondon who's a board member and Jess Colson who's the Director of Development for Girls Inc. of the Valley thank you both so much thank you you can find out ways to get involved with their organization at their website which I think is just Girls Inc. MA like Valley it will be in our show notes (laughs) Tomorrow on the Fabulous 413, we'll chat with Ido Moore of Secret Planet about their new festival, as well as Welcome Orchestra Gold, who'll be playing. Chef Natalie Duran tells us about a fundraising event happening at New City Brewery. I'm Khalees Smith. And I'm Monty Belmonte. We'll see you tomorrow on the Fabulous 413.